I'm Ellen Stofan, the John and Adrian Mars Director of the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to our GE Aviation Lecture tonight. We have a really exciting program for you tonight. The GE Aviation Lecture Series is the museum's longest running sponsored program. We've hosted more than 150 of them since 1982. Thanks to the support of GV GE Aviation, we have been able to provide access to these programs free of charge, both for those attending in person and more recently, all over the world via our live webcast and social media. Representing GE Aviation in the audience tonight are Mo Cowan, President of Gover Global Government Affairs and Policy at GE, and Peter Prowett, Executive Director of Global Government Relations at GE Aviation. Thank you both for joining us tonight and for GE Avi Aviation's continued support of the museum. I'm excited about tonight's speaker. One of the, my favorite parts of my job here at the National Air and Space Museum is getting to meet the inspiring men and women who broke boundaries in pursuit of their dreams. And tonight's speaker is no exception. Janora Jessen has had a truly remarkable and path-breaking career in avi aviation. She's been a pilot, flight instructor, business owner, and published author. And she has worked tirelessly to at advance the role of women in aviation. She served as the international president of the 99s organization, a role once held by another inspiring woman, Amelia Earhart. For 90 years, the 99s have encouraged, helped, and celebrated women pilots. She worked as a sales demo pilot for Beach Aircraft Corporation, flying their entire line of airplanes through every state in the continental United States. And she played an important role in the history, in history as one of an elite group of women who took part in the physical testing regiment used for NASA's Mercury astronauts. The program at Lovelace Medical Center evaluated women's potential as possible space travelers. Janora was one of the 13 women to pass the same physical tests NASA used to select astronauts, though the program was canceled and she returned then to her very successful aviation career. Janora's story, along with those other women in the Lovelace Women in Space program, is told in a fascinating book by National Air and Space Museum curator Margaret Weidekamp called Right Stuff, Wrong Sex. But lucky for us tonight, we get to hear about Janora's experiences firsthand. It is my pleasure to introduce Janora Jessen. Thank you. Thank you for that nice introduction. And I'm so happy to see you here. This next slide, that's the Three Musketeers. This, this slide is uh, what started it all for me. I grew up in Evanston, Illinois, and uh, my older brother heard about the Civil Air Patrol. And for those of you who are not familiar with Civil Air Patrol, these were the people who guarded our, our shores during World War II. And today, they go out and, and do a search and rescue looking for airplanes that are lost, uh, pilots who are lost. And uh, they have a wonderful program for kids. And so my older brother heard about it, and uh, I started going to the meetings. They were uh, at the uh, Palwaukee Airport in Chicago, and this was the first airplane. The seniors, they have a real great program for kids, but the seniors, of course, are, are the ones who give us the rides. And this one man always took me for a ride when I went out there on the weekend. And uh, he said to me, you're a natural. Well, huh, if I'm a natural, maybe I could be a pilot. He said I'm a natural, so it must be true. And that phrase from that man, it, it directed my entire life because I've been flying airplanes ever since then. And so it's, I think it's just an example of how important your support is for kids because that's how I discovered aviation because this man took me flying and, 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 and included me in, 
in the flying skills and uh, and so I picked out a university that had a flight school. And the next slide, yeah. The University of Oklahoma had a large flight school and I got on the train in uh, Chicago, rode the train down to Norman, Oklahoma and uh, went to school there. And they had a very large flight school and I enrolled and uh, they, they took all the, uh, all the lessons for the various ratings became a private pilot, commercial pilot, flight instructor. And uh, the, uh, we didn't have loans then, student loans then. So I would drop out of school for a semester and I'd go to work and I'd get enough money put together to go back and take some more flying lessons. And uh, sure enough, soon, soon enough, I had the, uh, the, what I needed to be a flight instructor. And the university hired me uh, to be a flight instructor, to be on the faculty, and uh, was the first female flight instructor that they had there. Um, this next slide, well, we were still on the CHAMP. The Aranka CHAMP was the airplane that, uh, that we taught in. They were, these are small trainers. We had a lot of competition with Oklahoma State University. If we've got any Okies here, you know all about that. And uh, so we competed in the two uh, flight schools. OU and OSU both had a, a good sized flight school. And, uh, and I'm pretty competitive, so I, I've got a certain amount of, of prizes there for the, for the training. While I was there, there was a girl who told me, she whispered to me, that she's involved in a secret astronaut training program. Of course, it wasn't a training program at all. It was, a, it was a testing program. But I thought that sounded pretty interesting because it would be challenging and it'd be interesting. You kind of get your finger in the pie. And so Dr. Lovelace uh, had a uh, hospital and a uh, big operation in Albuquerque. And he had a contract with, uh, with the space program to do all the uh, examinations to, for the selection process for astronauts. So he thought that it would be a good idea if he tested women also, because I don't know if you've ever noticed, when you look at the pictures of those early astronauts, they're not very tall. It's because the, the spacecraft they were going to be flying in was small. And of course, Dr. Lovelace is thinking, well, these women are smaller. Uh, and uh, they, you don't have to take as much food on the flight with, with them. And uh, I'm going to test women and see how they do with the, with the physical examinations uh, for flight training, for being an astronaut. And uh, so I wrote Dr. Lovis a letter and I said, uh, I understand that you're doing these tests and I'm physically fit and I have a certain number of hours flying time in small airplanes and I'd like to volunteer for your program. And he came right back and uh, he said, come on. And so uh, I was the, he uh, examined uh, 50, I take it back, 25 females uh, on these exams and 13 of us passed the exams. And the next slide, please. I want you to meet Donna Shirley. Donna Shirley uh, came to OU from Winniewood, Oklahoma. And she came to OU already a private pilot. And uh, she wanted to take some more flying lessons at the flight school and um, get the advanced ratings. And so then she came to the university and uh, decided she wanted to be an engineer uh, and uh, an aviation type engineer. And uh, they told her, well, <laughs> we're, we're very sorry, but girls aren't engineers. We, won't, we don't have a program for you. So she did, not, she did not go to the engineering school. She did get a degree at OU and something else. But then uh, she went later to uh, another school and got the engineering degree. Uh, Donna. Uh, decided that she would go to work for the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And they hired her, put her to work, and the first thing that 
the first assignment that they gave her was the uh, the rover. She uh, was in charge of the engineers who were designing the rover so that the astronauts would not have to do all that walking. They'd have a, the equipment to, to ride. And uh, in fact, uh, she was the person you always saw on television explaining what they were doing uh, when they were on the rover. Uh, so she uh, grew older. She retired as we all grew older. And uh, about that time, the University of Oklahoma came around uh, and they were, they were trying to hire people. And they found Donna Shirley and they hired her and they made her a dean in their, uh, in their, their engineering school. Don't you just love it? <laughs> so that's Donna Shirley. And uh, we're still in, in uh, contact. We still talk all the time. And uh, she's, she's a, a, just a beacon. She's a smart, smart lady and wanted to be an engineer. And she became an engineer. Next slide. Um, this is just one of the, the uh, tests for the astronaut uh, examination. that We went to uh, Albuquerque, Dr. Lovelace's clinic there, and he had done all the exams for all the astronauts. And uh, it took about a week, and there were some very weird uh, type exams. It was very thorough. And uh, I, I, we went through the tests in pairs, and I happened to go through the test with Janie Hart. Now, Janie Hart's husband happens to be Senator Phil Hart. And uh, you probably know the Hart Building in Washington. And, and Janie is the mother of seven. And she was too old for the program. But I think that Dr. Lovelace was just curious about this mother of seven. And uh, she was very athletic and how she would do on these tests. And she, she did great. And she was marvelous. And in the evening after we'd, we'd gone through all the tests of the day, We'd get together and compare notes and giggle and all of that. And uh, Janie was a marvelous person, and she did uh, pass the test. She was among the 13 who, who passed the test. And the next slide. So after we passed the test, the 13 of us passed the test, uh, then Dr. Lovelace made uh, arrangements with the Navy to go down to Pensacola and do more testing water type stuff. And uh, so we were all ready to go. The 13 of us who had passed were going to go down to Florida and, and take more tests. And uh, I asked for the time off for my job teaching flying at OU. And it was the very beginning of the semester. And you fly pretty heavily at the beginning of the semester because you haven't soloed anybody yet. And uh, so I asked them for just two weeks off to go down to Florida. And they said they just couldn't give it to me because they were too busy. They had to fire, hire another flight instructor. So I quit my job to go on down to Pensacola and take more tests. Um, just right after I quit my job, in fact, the same week, uh, we got the news that the tests were canceled. And the reason was uh, NASA had been approached by the Navy, and they were saying we were going to have these uh, 16 women down here, we're going to test them for two weeks. It's going to be expensive. We just need a piece of paper from you, uh, Mr. NASA, uh, to tell us that it's needed and uh, we should go ahead. And NASA said, what women? They had no interest in testing women. They had no interest in female astronauts. And so the deal was off. So there I was, uh, unemployed astronaut. <laughs> so uh, I got another job teaching flying. And then I wrote a letter to uh, everybody in the United States, I think, who had airplane in their name looking for a job. And uh, Beach Aircraft Corporation at that particular time was coming out with a new model airplane, which they had named the Musketeer. And uh, they had decided that they were going to have a three airplane tour of the US, they would, these, these, the three musketeers would visit all of the uh, dealers and distributors in the United States, uh, be a 90-day tour to call on all of them and sell airplanes. 
And so uh, when my letter came across the desk of the vice president, he hired me. And they, uh, we, we went uh, flying in these brand new wonderful airplanes. Uh, and that picture there of Joyce Case, I want to talk about Joyce for a minute. Joyce was already uh, working at Beach. There were only uh, two women in the United States, Joyce and Janie Hart. I mean, Jane, I'm, I'm losing it now. Anyway, it'll come. Uh, the one who was the head of our group, and uh, they were the only two females uh, flying for aircraft companies. And uh, so when they hired me, now there were three in the US flying for aircraft companies. Uh, Joyce was the National Women's Aerobatic Champion, and that's her pit special. She and her dad built that airplane, and they periodically built airplanes with bigger engines, and uh, she was the National Women's Aerobatic Champion. Beach never did let her fly aerobatics again, because uh, they, they thought that was dangerous to have her bearing the, the name of the Beach aircraft and uh, maybe get in trouble on a on a, on, a, on a flight, so she didn't fly the pits anymore, but that's Joyce. She was a wonderful pilot and a, and a dear friend. Okay, another slide. There is Genora with Mrs. Beach, and Mrs. Beach was the president of Beach Aircraft Corporation. Walter Beach had died, and uh, the Beaches had a, had a daughter, and uh, she wanted to learn to fly, so I was teaching her how to fly. and. Uh, she, she said to me one day, you know, it always bothers me when people say to me, it's so wonderful when your dad, Walter Beach, died that your mom, Olive Ann Beach, was able to take over the company. And she said, why, of course she did. She said, dad uh, designed airplanes, built them, sold them. Mom was the person in the company who was the business person. And so naturally, she was the president of the company. And so in that picture, uh, you see Mrs. Beach, and there I am. And Mrs. Beach, if she was going to have females flying for her, they were going to be ladies. So Joyce and I always flew in a dress and high heels, and which was no problem. You just hook the, your high heels under the rudder pedals, and, uh, and it worked out fine. So there's, there's a method to her madness. We were, we were ladies. Next slide. These are the two men who were involved with this new airplane called the Musketeer. And uh, on, the, on the right in the photo is John Elliott and uh, the design, prime di design engineer on the airplane, and Mike Gordon, who was going to be the head of the, the uh, sales department for the Musketeer line. And uh, we were going to fly these three airplanes in formation in, uh, for 90 days in all the states. And uh, everybody who had a dealership, we'd go and, and fly all their customers who might be uh, interested in buying a Musketeer. And uh, so that was the start of the Three Musketeers flight. Next slide. There's, uh, that's the prototype. That's the first one off the line. This timing was not good. It was a little hurried. And uh, the airplanes were just coming off the assembly line as the, the, the advertising people got going on selling these airplanes and putting together a tour, a 90-day tour of the US. Next slide. This one is, uh, is a picture of what the airplanes go through. Uh, I lost it. Oh, there it is. That's uh, the static testing. And what they do, they put it in that brace, and then they, they uh, push everything really hard to try to break it. And they're just, or see how far they can go stressing uh, the material on the airplane. So that was a static test. And really, um, they didn't like people to watch that, but it really gave you confidence in the airplane when you saw how strong uh, it was. OK, next slide. And there's the assembly line. Uh, I think that's the third airplane off the assembly line, but they're coming down the assembly line, and we're, we're supposed to be leaving on our tour right away. Uh, of course, we were the three musketeers, you understand. Okay, next slide. 
And there we are, ready to go. There's Mike. Mike is our boss. He's head of the Musketeer Sales Department. And Joyce and Janora in our dress and high heels. And we're, we're ready to go. We've had about two hours of flying time in those airplanes. We know nothing about those airplanes. And uh, they're brand new. And you know when you have a new airplane, a brand new airplane, that there are going to be some changes made in the airplane, strengthening the airplane in various ways. So anyway, here we are, ready to go on this tour. Next slide. And that's Mrs. Beach out there. Uh, shaking hands and saying goodbye. Photographers, there's one, one particular photographer who always, was, who always was with Mrs. Beach. He took all the pictures. And incidentally, the reason I can do this slide program is because we always had a photographer with us, and so that's why I have all these pictures. Okay, the next one. <laughs> we, did a, we did a formation takeoff. Now, we had never flown any formation. And plus we got the, they were still painting our names on the doors of the airplanes the night before we left. This was a speed up, hurry up deal to get this thing going. And so we're there, but we're about, our takeoff in formation, we're just about all in a different county. <laughs> the registration numbers on American airplanes uh, start with N, November, and that means United States. And so the, assembly, the line, the, the numbers that we got for our airplanes were N, 2301 Zulu, 2302 Zulu, 2303 Zulu. So of course, we were onesie, twosie, and threesie. <laughs> and uh, so in big letters on the side of the airplane, 2301 Zulu, that was uh, Mike, and he had the blue airplane. And Joyce uh, was twosie. 2302 Zulu, one, and, and she had the uh, beige airplane. And I was 2303 Zulu, and I had the red airplane, which, as you know, red is the fastest color. <laughs> so I had the best airplane. <laughs> so off we went. And <laughs> as I say, we were not at all close in our formation. But the next slide shows you that we're getting better. The practice makes perfect. So uh, we got so we could, we could fly pretty good formation and stay in close. Mike did all the talking, and uh, we listened and did whatever the directions were. You know, they call the control tower, and, and he gets uh, cleared for a flight of three. And what we always did, we'd go into the dealership, and we would um, invite the dealer of course, want to sell airplanes. So he's invited everybody he can find who might be a good prospect for a Musketeer airplane. And uh, so we would take them flying. And we would put the customer in the left seat. We're all three of us flight instructors. And we'd sit in the right seat. And this person would fly the airplane. And the only time we had to find out what they knew about flying airplanes was as we were taxiing out. We'd say, well, uh, Mr. Mr. Pilot, what, what do you usually fly? Well, I usually fly thus and so. I usually, and you, you probably had flown that kind of airplane, and you, so you knew approximately what he knew, and you could tell when they took off and so on. And so you're walking them th through, talking them through uh, this whole process, uh, trying to make them look good in the airplane so that they want to buy one. And uh, so, the uh, the next slide, please. That is the instrument panel in this airplane. Right down at the bottom of the center, and you look up a little bit, is the radio. Now, if there are any pilots here, this, <laughs> we don't fly with one radio anymore. And this is, this is 1962. And uh, these radios, they were king radios, but they had the beach name on them. And they had been hurried out. They were not ready to go. They did not work very often. And so Mike was doing all the talking. He would talk to the tower wherever we went. We'd go in land and, and pick up customers, take them flying. And uh, he, would, he would do the talking. And Joyce and I would listen. And whatever the directions were, we would, we would fall in and, and do the same thing. So uh, 
sometimes it got pretty serious because Joyce and I, one or the other or both, uh, would not have the directions of what we were doing. We went into one, uh, one airport, and uh, what we would do when we arrived, of course, we, our PR people, they would be there, and they would be getting customers, the, the dealer's customers out there, and get them all lined up, and they're all watching. Here comes the three musketeers. And uh, we would fly down the taxiway close. We were getting good at that. And then we'd peel off and come in and land and pick up customers, take them flying. And uh, we had, because of this radio, on one occasion, uh, we were just out of radio. That's all there was to it. And we didn't know what was going on. And we landed. They cleared us to land on, a, on, on the runway. And we landed on three different runways. And I think that the tower was just a little startled about how we did business. And uh, obviously, we had to do something about the radio. So what they did for a while until they got the radios in better shape, we each had a, one of those great, big, humongous radios that they use to fly across the ocean when they're delivering an airplane. And so we'd, we'd, uh, we gave, gave up on the little King radios until they got them perfected. And we were using these humongous, big radios. and. The customers, uh, they were a little, a little surprised that that's the kind of radio we had because there was something right there in, in the airplane, and we, but we weren't using it. And so anyway, that was just one of, the, one of the problems. We had, we made 80 changes in that airplane the first year, which is a lot, and you'll find that it's not a lot compared to a lot of airplanes. Much of that was little tiny stuff that just didn't really matter, but it was in the list. Some of it was just somewhat major. But at any rate, uh, I'll tell you right now that what they did at the end of the year, at the end of our, our, our time showing the airplane, uh, they brought all the airplanes that they had sold that first year, uh, brought them back to the factory, and uh, brought them up to date. And uh, that, that was good because the airplanes, they were safe but they were not sharp. They were not good enough. And so they all came back to the factory, got fixed up, and until they were a real good airplane. OK, here's the, uh, next, the next slide. There's 3Z. We called each other 1Z, 2Z, and 3Z, of course. And that's me. The dark one is red. And uh, we, uh, that airplane right there, of course, the airplanes were all sold. The one Z, two Z, and three Z were sold, and uh, there's a Musketeer group uh, of people who all own Musketeer airplanes, very loyal to the airplane. And in Tullahoma, Tennessee, where Mr. Beach grew up, there's a humongous museum there, a Beach Museum, and they have a copy of every model that uh, one copy of every model that Beach has made through the years. And um, they happened to buy my airplane. Somebody in, in Wisconsin bought that airplane. And he was willing to sell it to get it in the museum. And um, so that was really neat. My airplane is in that museum. I subsequently wrote a book called The Fabulous Flight of the Three Musketeers. So that makes me a hero with that uh, group of musketeer owners, because they love their musketeers. And um, so uh, as a result, <laughs> They were trying to raise money to buy that airplane. The club was. And uh, so I signed a bunch of books, and, and they'd, get, uh, they'd get a reward. Uh, they, they'd put some money into the, buying that airplane. And uh, they'd, of course, they'd get a signed book, naturally. And uh, so anyway, 3Z is in the Tullahoma Beach Museum. And uh, when I go there, I'm the queen. They are just so nice, because they love my airplane, as I do. OK, next one. So we flew formation clear across the country, all across the country. We had a chase plane with us at all times. And we carried um, the chase plane carried, uh, what did they carry? They had a movie man. They had a still, uh, a still picture man, and which is the reason I have all these pictures. 
and uh, he was in the airplane all the time, and the movie man sometimes was in the airplane. We had a uh, mechanic and uh, who would talk to the other, the mechanics at the dealers where we stopped and visited. We had an engineer, a design engineer on the airplane, and we had a public relations person. Now the public relations guy flew in the chase plane, and they would go in right ahead of us, and uh, he, would, he would make sure that the uh, publicity was going, that the uh, newspapers were there, and the TV was there, and the customers were there, and so on. And when we arrived, we would make a three airplane pass down the taxiway, and low, of course, and as fast as we could go, and uh, then come around and land. And then we would pick up the customers, and we'd take them flying, and, and put them in the left seat, let them fly the airplane, and so on. So anyway, that, uh, th those, those people who flew with us in the, uh, in the other airplane, of course, we didn't carry them all at once. They kind of took turns being in that airplane. But uh, they were very helpful to have along. Next slide. Now this one is Gino Carrado. And he is one of the original musketeers in the movie. And so when we got to movie land, uh, we landed on the taxiway, put him in my airplane, and uh, then fired him up again and took off and came around and made a pass. And then when we uh, finished that, we landed. And here this musketeer with the sword gets out of my airplane. And, and uh, that got a lot of notice. Next one. Of course, the, uh, the photographers, they had to have a good time, too. So they set up this picture, Joyce and me in our dresses and high heels, helping, helping Mike get out of the airplane. And the next one, please. And there's a TV interview. And my home is uh, Boise, Idaho. And uh, that's in Boise, Idaho, that long before I ever lived there. But that's a, a pretty first class uh, TV studio, wouldn't you say? And so we did a lot of that, a lot of the TV and, and newspapers. And, and that was the job of some of the, the PR guy in the, uh, in the chase plane was to, to get those people out to give us some publicity for our airplane. OK, the next one. Now we're flying. Then we had to do advertising photos. And um, there we are, Mount Rainier. I have to tell you a little bit about advertising. Uh, when you have a change in your model, uh, of course, you, you buy advertising coverage in all the aviation magazines. And uh, so Mrs. Beach's airplane was always the top of the line. And she had the King Air. And the N number on it were onesie, twosie, and threesie. Her N number is, is uh, 925B. 925 was her birthday and B for Beach, of course. And so every time they had a, a new model, uh, they'd repaint it, and she would get the new model with 925B on it. And so it, uh, it, it, was, it was fun. Uh, one, one little problem that we had with that was that sometimes the new model came out at the wrong time as far as the advertising was concerned. So what they did, the first airplane off the assembly line with the new model, they would paint one side of the airplane one color and paint the other side the other design. And that way, they had two airplanes. And so it, the magazines didn't all have the same airplane. They had two of them. But they were all 925B for Mrs. Beach. OK, next one. And there's Mike. And it's his blue airplane. We should have that one in color because it's a beautiful shot got a lot of advertising out of that particular picture. Next one. Right there, I'm sure you can't see it, but in the background is the uh, Seattle Space Needle. And so the flying farmers were having their convention there. And they were all up in the top of the Space Needle. And uh, there was a track around it where they, uh, way up high, you know, where they could get out there and watch the scenery. So, of course, we flew in formation around the Space Needle, and they're all standing there waving. 
of course, it was against the law. We found out later you're not allowed to fly around the Space Needle. <laughs> but we avoided jail somehow. I don't know how. Okay, next one. Now, this is the lineup of the airplanes that were in production at that particular time in 1962. And uh, it, it was my great fortune that uh, Mrs. Beach wanted the girls to be flying all of those airplanes. So I checked out in all the airplanes and flew them all. Those are all different models. And um, it, it was such an honor to get to fly only brand new airplanes and various models. You start off with the little old musketeer, then you go on up the line and you're flying things like the King Air. Joyce eventually became a production test pilot on the King Air. And uh, so that's the lineup right there of all the airplanes that were in production at that, at that particular time. Um, I want to tell you a little story here that they, those airplanes are lined up at the end of the runway. Uh, the beach field had a private uh, airport, and uh, those airplanes are on the runway. There was a production test pilot one day who went out and uh, didn't, didn't bother uh, with his uh, looking at what he should have looked at, your, your checklist, and check it all and make sure you've looked at everything. And he neglected the checklist, and he didn't realize that the guy who had flown that airplane before he flew it had turned off the, the gas. The fuel was turned off. And what happens when uh, you fly an airplane and the gas is turned off, it'll, you've got enough gas in the lines to taxi out and take off. And then it quits. So this fellow uh, taxied out and Brownie, Mr. Brown, operated the tower. It was a private tower, and he operated the tower, and he cleared him for takeoff, and the production test pilot took off, and uh, he got it in the air, and the engine quit. So he's got two choices. He's close to the end of the runway. He can put it on the runway, and uh, if he does that, he's going to go through the fence, and he'll probably uh, he'll go out of end onto the road He'll cross the road, and um, hopefully there will be no car there at that time. Or his choice is he can see if he can get it over the wires and put it in the company um, parking lot. So he did. He did the parking lot. He got that airplane into the parking lot, did a beautiful job landing the airplane between two rows of cars, and... He, uh, <laughs> he got out of the airplane. Uh, he, didn't, he did not scratch the airplane, and he did not scratch a car. But he got out of the airplane. He had his car key in his pocket, and he was never seen again. <laughs> the, uh, the Mrs. B he knew. You know, I told you already, Mrs. Beach was the president of that company, and she was the president, I assure you. She ran the place, and he knew she would never tolerate uh, going off without checking the fuel. And so he was gone, because he knew in a New York minute she would fire that man. Okay, next, uh, next slide. This is just uh, another picture of uh, the, the uh, photographers at work. You know, they always had these wonderful ideas of how we should we should line up and so on. So there we are, getting out of the airplane, wherever we were. And the next slide. We did some, we did some nice show, night shows, and that one happened to be in Tulsa. And who should show up at that open house that evening? But the fellow who taught me to fly at the University of Oklahoma. So that was fun. See my old flight instructor there. Uh, next slide. There was a guy by the name of Roscoe Turner and in Indianapolis, and uh, he, was, uh, he, he flew stunts, and he sold some airplanes, and he always got lots of publicity, particularly because he had uh, a little animal there. Can you, can you see what he is? He's a lion. He's a little lion cub. And everybody wanted to go and see uh, 
Roscoe Turner and his little lion cub. Of course, the problem is if you have an animal and you feed it, next slide, it grows. So they had to retire the cub because he couldn't get in the airplane anymore. Okay, next slide. He was a, that guy was a, was a case. He was funny. Okay, this next one is uh, at Windsor Locks, Connecticut. And uh, that is a factory where they build command helicopters. And outside the factory, you can see they have a place there where they can display the product. And uh, so they let us use that place. And um, I'm standing at the tail of the airplane. Joyce is getting out of the airplane. They never did, Beach never did hire uh, models. And because why bother? You've got pilots who are flying these airplanes. And so why not use them as models? The thing is, they have to pay you if you're going to be a model. And so we got a dollar to model. And so, of course, we love to look in the ads and say, oh, there's Mary Jo and there's John and so on, you know, because all the pilots were the models. They didn't hire any models. Next one. On that one, I'm flying, I've got uh, four people in that airplane on that one, and uh, we're flying over the Statue of Liberty, which I would suspect today is illegal. But if you could look at that picture pretty closely, the background is just very bare. And uh, it'd be interesting to fly that, s that spot again and uh, see how many houses are there now. I'm sure it's all built up. Okay, the next one. Now this, this particular landing was, uh, I, I flew with a guy who was a real low time pilot. And as I said, the only information you get is as you're taxiing out, they, they, they're lined up to go for a ride with you, fly the airplane. And um, so you don't have much time to talk to them and say, oh, how many hours do you have? How, what do you fly? And so on. So as you're taxiing out, you ask them what they've been flying, and they tell you what they've been flying. That gives you an idea of what they know and how advanced they are and so on. This guy was doing just fine in the airplane. And uh, so while we were out flying, when we came back, the wind had shifted, and uh, they changed runways. So we needed to land on a different runway than we took off from. And the uh, the as I say, the pilot was doing okay. I'm talking him through this. And what happened is entirely my fault. I should have taken over the controls and uh, realized he was pretty tense. And, but, you know, ego got in the way. I think I just thought, well, God, shoot, I'm a good fly instructor. I can talk him down. So anyway, we've got a real good crosswind coming in, and it was, it was beyond him. And when he touched down, Everything, he froze, everything went forward. The throttle went forward, the feet went forward on the brakes, the yoke went forward, and we went up on the, on the right landing gear and the main gear, and uh, this is a low wing airplane, so it's not gonna take too much to drag a wing. And uh, I, had, I had never scratched, I never have scratched an airplane. And uh, I'm thinking, we are, gonna, we are gonna drag this wing because it was way low. So I slapped his hand and I got it off the throttle, but the rest of it, he's still in, in <laughs> control, so to speak. And uh, so anyway, miraculously, it did not drag the wing and we came to rest out there in, in the grass. And uh, so then, what do you say to the guy? My, my, wasn't that exciting, you know? <laughs> was for me. And so the tower comes on. And the tower says, and of course, I had been doing the talking. The tower thinks I'm flying. And the tower comes on and, and say, Musketeer, 2303 Zulu, are you experiencing difficulties? And I said, negative. I always land this way. <laughs> so anyway, we went in. And the, the guy did not buy an airplane. <laughs> Surprise. And John Elliott, the design engineer on this airplane, uh, he was there and witnessed what was going on with this musketeer. And he said, Genora, we never did run a, a, a test on the landing gear that serious. 
And I said, well, you're welcome, John. You know, took care of that for you. Okay, another one. And that's, uh, this one is just our logo in the back of the airplane. There were only three airplanes ever built that had that logo on the tail. And of course, the one in, uh, at Tullahoma, Tennessee, the, uh, the museum has that airplane with the logo on it. The next one. We always carried a mechanic with us, uh, partly to keep our airplanes running that were flying long and hard. But part of their job, too, was to meet with the, the uh, mechanics who worked for the dealers and uh, give them the advice about the airplane and what was new, what they had not seen before, and that kind of thing. And so that picture is our mechanic talking to the dealer's mechanics. Next slide. This picture. Uh, shows us looking at a paper aeronautical chart. <laughs> you don't see those anymore. <laughs> Everything is electronic now, of course. And uh, so we, we're you know, looking like we're planning our next stop. The, uh, I remember that dress, and it was wool. So this picture must have been taken uh, in the fall, because this, this uh, 90 days, of course, went through the summer and into the fall when we were demonstrating the airplanes. Next slide. There are two tired pilots. We're in Miami Beach, Florida. And uh, we are tired. We have been out for 90 days. What we would do, we would go out for two weeks, and uh, then we'd uh, come back in, and they'd work on the airplanes on the weekend. We'd do our laundry and then we'd go out again the next week. So this went on for uh, 90 days. And here we are in Miami. It's the end of the tour. We can go home. And Mike says, you know, we're so tired. Why don't we just go to the Bahamas? We said, OK, that's what we're going to do. So next slide. The, uh, oh, before we went to, the to uh, over the water, which I don't like. There's three airplanes there uh, on the, the bottom and left of the picture. And uh, the one with the dark wings, that's me, 3Z. And uh, if, you look, if you're a pilot and you look right straight ahead of, on the nose of 3Z, a little bit to the left, I kind of doubt that you can. Yeah, you can see that. That is a beach bonanza with two engines. And there is no such thing as a beach bonanza with two engines. And there, there, a lot of pilots, a lot, a certain number of pilots are inspired to do their own thing with their airplane. And it's legal. They, do, they can do it legally. And this is the only one that I've ever seen with two engines. Somebody had put an extra engine on that airplane, took the engine off the nose and put it on each wing. And uh, that airplane is now in the Museum of Tullahoma. Okay. The uh, next slide, please. Okay, the tour was over, and Mike said, let's go to the Bahamas. So we did. And uh, the next slide shows Joyce peeling off, headed for the Bahamas. We got over there. They missed the best picture, I think, of the whole trip uh, here. Because when we went to the Bahamas, there was a, there was a, a clip on the, the nose of the airplane, and uh, it was loose, and it needed some attention. And so our mechanic was there working on it. And there was a police officer there, and he was holding the tools. And the, the, he was very, very British. And he had this magnificent uniform on, and he's holding the tools for our me mechanic. I just felt like that was the best picture of the whole trip, and, and they, miss, they missed it. They missed the mechanic. OK, next slide. I don't want to finish this without introducing my husband, Bob. Bob was one of those kids, teenagers, who, when World War II came along, uh, volunteered. And he went to work uh, for the Army Air Corps, learned to fly the airplanes, flew the B-29. And uh, the day that he went to war, uh, finished his training, which is a long process for a, a guy who's never flown anything. And uh, so the day he left to go to war and, and flew to the coast to leave, Harry dropped the bomb. 
so Bob never did go to war. His timing was just absolutely perfect. But he flew the big airplanes, and uh, he came to Beach Aircraft, and uh, that's where we met. And uh, we married, and then we uh, left Beach Aircraft and uh, moved to Boise, Idaho to be a beach dealer. Um, Idaho is, has fabulous mountains and backcountry, and there's a lot of flying going on in the backcountry. Uh, people come from all over to go fishing and go hunting, uh, just go to the mountains and so on. And uh, so airplane sales are very good there. And there was no dealer in, uh, in Idaho, so uh, we moved to Idaho and became a dealer. 19, uh, I think it was 74, and uh, then later we retired and uh, got the motor home and went on a tour. The, uh, and that's a story. This is the, the next slide. I think we had one more. Yeah, the Three Musketeers. Um, I, I fell in love with that airplane and uh, was, certainly knew the airplane well. And so I wrote a book about the fabulous flight of the Three Musketeers. And uh, so that was published. And then I wrote the book about uh, the women pilots, the 1929 Air Derby and uh, Sky Girls. I have some bad news. While I was here today looking around the, the museum, I saw in the sales office a book entitled Fly Girls. Now, Sky Girls is my book. <laughs> I'll have to admit that I went out, when that book came out, I went out and bought a copy. And because I was just all ready to, to criticize him and, and find his mistakes and all that kind of, it's a very good book. <laughs> Mine's better. <laughs> Sky Girls. Okay, the, uh, we have time here, I think, for some questions or comments or, or whatever. You'd like to say, yes, there's a question or something? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yes? The, your, talk showed, yeah, your talk showed about you flying on those three zip aircraft. You didn't fly any of the top jets like you do, like C-90 King Air or anything like that. I flew I'm just going to repeat the question. So the question is, did you get to fly any of the prop jets, the C? I, I flew everything they made, yeah. That, that was a big deal for Mrs. Beach. She's going to have girl pilots. They're going to fly the airplanes. I do, wa I do want to say one thing that I forgot to mention. The, the, uh, the, it was known that the wife kills more airplane sales than any other factor, including money. And so, uh, of course, if you're in the sales department at the Beach Factory, your job is to help the dealers and the distributors sell airplanes. So um, Mrs. Beach got a, a call and uh, the, the dealer said, we've got, a, we've got a female problem here. So uh, they, the husband wanted to buy a Baron, a twin engine airplane, which I love. And uh, so I got in a Baron and, and flew where they lived and um, took, the, took the wife for an airplane ride, talked about the magic carpet. It'll take you all these wonderful places and so on. And she said, uh, I don't care if he buys an airplane. It's all right with me. He can buy the airplane if he wants it but I'll never get in it, because when he kills himself, somebody's got to raise the children. So that explained that there are some dumb male pilots out there who scare their wives. See, that's what he had done. Yeah. I'm sorry. When was the last time that you flew for Beach? For Beach? Yes. Well, when we sold our business, we were a Beach dealer and uh, flew for beach. I, I kept a musketeer when we retired. I quit flying two months ago. I got macular degeneration, and it takes two good eyes to have depth reception. And um, it makes for really exciting landings if you don't have any depth reception. <laughs> so, so I quit flying two years ago. And I can't tell you the last time I flew a beach airplane. Well, I flew. We owned a musketeer right up till I quit flying. The question is, did yeah, you fly the yeah, 1900s? Yeah, but just barely, just barely, yeah. I didn't, uh, there was a guy named Jelly Filer. Jelly Filer had uh, learned to fly in Tullahoma, Tennessee, where Mr. Beach was. When Mr. Beach designed the Twin Beach and uh, Model 18, 
and taught this young man, this kid, to fly that airplane. So when I came along to the beach factory, Jelly Filer was a production test pilot. And he taught me to fly the Model 18, which was fabulous because this man knew that, or he, he didn't fly an airplane, he just wore it. And so I had some really good instructors at the beach factory when, I mean, shoot, if they're gonna turn us loose. I forgot to tell you the story about the lights. Have you got time for another story? The, uh, if you landed, uh, I, I went on the beach one night. Beach didn't have lights at night. The be this is, beach is a private field. And uh, Brownie, Mr. Brown, ran the tower. And they shut it down at night because there were no lights. And so I called municipal just to get the, a reading on the grounds, on the wind and so on, and told them I was landing at Beach Field and uh, you know, what are the conditions. And, and the, the controller over at the municipal airport gave me the information I wanted. And he said, and Beach does not have lights. I said, thank you very much. So as I got closer to Beach Field, he called me again. And he said, he said uh, I was flying a travel air. And he said, travel air, uh, do you understand that Beach Field does not have lights? And I said, that's right, I understand. Thank you very much. So the way you get into Beach Field at night without any lights is that they've got a red light on the, on the wires at the end of the t runway. And at the, that's the north end of the runway. And that red light is on at all times, just one light. Down at the south end of the field is the, is the Kmart store. And they leave their lights on at night. <laughs> So you just line up the red light with the Kmart store, and you come on as soon as you get over the wires, then you start down and, uh, and you're home. You pick up, pick up the runway with your landing light, and then you're home. So that's, that's how we got in at night at Beachfield. Did, I got a little off the subject there, did, but did we answer your question? It's okay, all right, yeah. Any other questions? I think we have one up here. One up there? I'm just going to repeat the question for our recording, which is um, if the Lovelace program had been able to be continued and the United States had had women astronauts in the 1960s, what would you have liked to have done? I, I'm glad you asked that question because when I went through that program, I had been flying the, the little trainer airplane. I hadn't one working for Beach yet. I was just teaching flying at the university. I had no qualifications to be an astronaut. I was a flight instructor, commercial pilot, and flight instructor. I knew I couldn't be an astronaut. I didn't have an engineering degree. I didn't have very many hours flying time. I was not gonna be an astronaut. I thought it was just a lot of fun to be involved. It was a challenge uh, to see if you could get through the, through the tests, which I did. And also, um, it, it was an adventure. But I wasn't gonna be an astronaut. Uh, and, and get, a, get a, a ticket to go to space. But the problem with the whole thing is that there were women in that program, the 13, the 13 women who passed, who really believed that they were gonna be astronauts. And um, a lot of times people have said to me, ask about the training I had. And if we didn't have any training, we had tests, we were tested but there was no training. We were not gonna be astronauts. So there are some women who were in that program who truly believed they were gonna be astronauts and it ruined their lives. Uh, Jerry Cobb, uh, who was our leader in our group, uh, died about two months ago. And she never gave up the belief that she was gonna go into space. She was always gonna go into space. There's another one who is still I think she spent her whole, everything she, she, she got from her parents uh, trying to buy a seat in the space. So my attitude is different than some of the others. Some of them believed they were in an astronaut training program. We were not. We were in a testing program and I passed the test. 
but I wasn't going to be an astronaut. Thank you. Anything else? Yes. What was the most fun that you had as a pilot? Oh, goodness. <laughs> you know, I still, on takeoff, say, why me, God? I love it. I just love it. And why did I get to do something that I liked that much? And, uh, you know, flying over the earth, the, the sights, the whole countryside, everything that you see, all the adventures that you have, the, the, the weather, and it's, it's wonderful. I love it. And most pilots do. So um, I don't think I can pick out a favorite. I think flying for beach was, uh, the, the whole thing was a favorite because I got to fly uh, all brand new airplanes and all different size airplanes. And, uh, and my instruction was from really fine pilots in those airplanes. So I would have to generally say flying for beach was, was a lot of fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any, anything else? Yes. How were you treated by male pilots in the early 1960s when you had such extraordinary opportunities as a woman pilot? Um, I think the attitude was um, if they let her fly the airplanes, she must know how to fly. I think there was, I think there, there was never any prejudice whatsoever. And uh, same thing in flight school at, at uh, OU. They, I think the attitude comes from above comes from the, the owner or the uh, boss and uh, happen to have owners and bosses who said, this is, this is one of my pilots and she knows how to fly these airplanes, so lay off. But it, there was, I never had any problem. And I know that that's, that's unusual because there are women who will tell you about all the dismal things that uh, they put up with with the male pilots. But I think it came from above. I think it came from the boss. Yeah. Was there any, any kind of plane that you had just, that just came off the factory line that you tested and realized, oh, gee, something is really wrong with this plane? Did you, did you was hear there it? ever a time that you had a plane that was fresh off the line, and when you got to working with it, you realized it wasn't in quite the shape that you had hoped it would be? Well, an airplane that was just off the line was uh, it was when we were on the Musketeer tour, and uh, because after that those the airplanes were <laughs> fine, but we carried a mechanic with us at all times, and these mechanics they grew up in their job with that airplane, and really knew the airplane, so we were very safe, but uh, it was uh, done on purpose. It it wasn't accidentally that we were safe. The airplanes were not ready. And uh, it, it, it was uh, smart to have, we always had a design engineer with us and a mechanic. And uh, we had a little trouble with the tail. We had a shimmy and it carried up to, up to the nose gear. And then the vibration went to the tail. And so there were some serious things that had to be watched. And um, we had some good people who were with us who who knew that airplane inside and out. And uh, so I, I felt very safe, but I was certainly aware of the shortcomings we had. You know, if you're making 80 changes on the airplane, that's a lot. And some of them were just so small, you can't hardly count them. But um, by bringing all the airplanes back to the factory, or if they wanted their, their dealer to do it, they, they were all brought up to date, and, uh, which I think was an important thing to do, or the airplane would have had a terrible reputation. I think we have time for one more, if we have one more question. Who wants the last word? Well, we've got all our questions, I think. Or did you get everyone? Yeah, there's one. Yes. Did you ever have any really scary, I guess, in-flight emergencies? Did you ever have any scary in-flight emergencies, and how did you deal with that? Scary in-flight emergencies. 
You know, I honestly can't think of anything right offhand. I think the only scary thing was that was that landing I, I uh, told you about. And that is, it was more embarrassing than anything else. <laughs> but I can't think of any, anything in flight. I did have um, I did have a an, an engine failure on takeoff one time with a student, and uh, it was it's really kind of funny because. In those Aronka champs, the flight instructor's in the back seat and the student's up in the front. And uh, so there was an en engine quit. And uh, when we practice things, we do things that for the, to catch the attention of the student. And uh, he turned around and he said, is this for real? <laughs> because why would I, why would I, could, anyway. It, uh, we put it on the ground and it was just a carburetor. That airplane had a carburetor and it was a carburetor thing and it was fine. We had plenty of runway to put it on, but yeah, that's, that's the only engine failure I ever had that was not purposely done. I would purposely do it to the students to see what their response was and where they were going to put it and so on. Okay, have we done it? Well, thank you very much. I am delighted that you were able to be here this thank evening. You. Thank you for coming. So I'm particularly pleased because uh, when I was writing Right Stuff, Wrong Sex, my name is Margaret Whiteycamp. I'm a curator here in space history. Uh, Janora was gracious enough to be my very first interview. Um, and so that whole project, and in many ways this career, I owe to the generosity of oh, you and Bob oh, having sure me you at do. your home. Oh, boy. Um, so I'm delighted that you were able to come here and tell us some of your stories. I think uh, we see what a, uh, both a fine pilot and fine author uh, Mrs. Jessen is. I want to thank uh, GE Aviation for their long-standing support of this program, which is a really wonderful opportunity to share some of these stories uh, with our National Air and Space Museum audience. And so I want to invite you, if you would like to meet Mrs. Jessen, she will be downstairs at the Welcome Center signing books. And so I'm going to invite you to exit through the rear so that we can get to that all the sooner. Thank you very much for uh, spending your evening here with us at the museum. Travel safely and have a good night.